Welcome students to my first lecture on Chapter 11's coverage of organometallic compounds and reactions. Before beginning today, I wanted to tell you an entertaining story that has nothing to do with anything. Many years ago, when I was a teenager, I had the opportunity of flying from Baltimore, Maryland, up to Newark, New Jersey, back to Annapolis, Maryland, down to Texas, and then back to my home state of Utah. When I arrived at the Baltimore airport, I was super excited and somewhat fearful as I realized I was going to be flying on a very small airplane with outside props, those little propellers that you could see. I think that we climbed into it on a rope ladder and there were only maybe a couple dozen passengers on board. As the airplane had arrived very, very late, I was slightly worried that I wasn't going to arrive on my connecting flight in Newark, New Jersey in time. I was a naive and overly optimistic teenager, however, so I figured everything would be okay. As we all settled on the plane, the pilot's voice came over the loudspeaker. He sounded like he was about 13 years old, which didn't instill a whole lot of confidence in my heart. He said, I'm sorry guys that we're kind of late. We sort of uh, had a problem with one of the propeller thingies in the back, and so uh, anyway, we're going to try and make it on time to Newark. I happened to be sitting at a seat that was located right next to the propeller thingy. As we started to take off, I could hear it churning and creaking under the stress, and I was super, super nervous that we were going to blow up and die. I have to tell you that I have a personal fear of flying. As we were getting close to the Newark airport, I couldn't help but overhear a passenger near me commenting that her layover in Newark had originally only been scheduled to be about one hour and a half. Because the plane had been delayed by 45 minutes, she was slightly concerned that she wouldn't be able to arrive to her connecting flight on time. As I overheard that, I smiled to myself and I thought, well, that's too bad, but I'm sure glad I'm not her. As we touched down at the New York airport, I, out of curiosity, pulled my ticket out and looked to see when my connecting flight was going to be departing. I discovered, to my great dismay, that it was actually leaving 30 minutes earlier than hers was, which means that I had about 15 minutes to get to it. I grabbed my bags and began running. I ran to the nearest help desk and asked them where gate 90 was. As it turns out, my current location was gate 1 or 2. So I had to traverse the entire Newark airport as fast as I could, running and sprinting and pushing people over and, and yelling, out of the way, I need to get in there, ah! I looked just like a commercial. As I got into the terminal, I actually did leap like a track star over a hurdle over a bank of chairs located in the middle of the terminal with my bag slung around each shoulder. I ran into the airplane just as they were about to close the door. Whew, I was glad that I made it on time. Ironically, as I flew from Newark to Texas, my next connecting flight, which was going to take me to Salt Lake, was delayed by about three hours. <laughs> ah, dang. So I had to basically sit in a plane on the tarmac for three hours in Houston until we were eventually allowed to take off. After today's lecture, you guys should be able to predict the products of organolithium and Grignard reactions and use them in synthesis. Predict the products of coupling reactions that I'll teach you, organocuprate, Suzuki, Stille, and Heck, and use them in synthesis. And predict the product of alkene metathesis and use them in synthesis. Now please note we will skip section 11.3. I'll now begin by teaching you about organolithium compounds. You can make an organolithium compound, which is also called an organolithium, by doing this. First you take an alkyl halide, such as this alkyl bromide, and react it with two equivalents of lithium metal. What it ends up doing is placing whatever alkyl chain, in this case a butyl chain, but this could be any other alkyl chain that's attached to your bromine, on the lithium. Another example of that is shown here. I take chlorobenzene, this molecule here, react it with two equivalents of lithium, and generate this molecule, phenolithium. Now you might ask, why in the world would I ever want to make an alkyl lithium or organolithium compound? Don't worry, I'll show you that momentarily. But before I do, I want to also show you how to make this type of reagent. You can make an alkyl magnesium reagent, which is also called a Grignard reagent, by doing this. You take any type of alkyl halide, such as an alkyl bromide shown here, react it with magnesium metal, and what ends up happening is the metal inserts itself between the hydrocarbon chain and the bromine. This type of molecule is called a Grignard reagent. Here's another example. I've got this molecule, which is called vinyl bromide. Once again, it's a bromine attached to a carbon, but this could also work with a chlorine or an iodine. And I react it with magnesium. The magnesium inserts itself between the carbon and the halogen. Once again, these types of reagents are called Grignard reagents. And yes, that is pronounced Grignard, not Grignard. Ugh. 
So what in the world can we do with these types of reagents? Well, organolithiums and Grignard reagents behave more or less like carbanions. For example, if I've got this type of molecule stuck to a lithium, which is called butyl lithium, it essentially behaves as if there's a negative charge on the carbon that's bonded to the lithium. So it would behave kind of like this molecule right here, where there's a negative charge on this carbon. Similarly, phenyl lithium shown here would react more or less as if there were a negative charge on this carbon right here, as I've indicated here. Similarly, a Grignard reagent, such as the one shown here, behaves more or less as if there's a negative charge on this carbon, the one bonded to the magnesium, as shown here. And in this example, vinyl magnesium bromide, it would behave more or less as if there were a negative charge on this carbon, the one that's bonded also to the magnesium. Now up to this point, we've traditionally talked about carbons as having partial positive charges, and the reason is because in most of the reactions we've discussed, they're often bonded to halogens or oxygens or nitrogens or other elements that are more electronegative than the carbons themselves. And these types of reagents, reagents in which I have a metal bonded to a carbon, you'll note that carbon is much more electronegative than the metal. So in these circumstances, the carbon is the guy who ends up hogging the electrons, which once again makes him behave as if he were more or less like a carbanion, a negatively charged carbon. So you might wonder, why is that useful? Well, as it turns out, you can take a molecule such as methyl lithium shown here and react it with an epoxide, for example. The methyl lithium once again behaves as if there's a negative charge on this carbon. What that does then is that the negatively charged carbon comes in here and attacks, like a nucleophile, one of the two carbons in this epoxide and pushes these electrons up onto the oxygen, giving me this intermediate. This negatively charged oxygen can then be protonated by adding water or acid to give us this type of product. Once again, you can see that this alkyl group that was attached to the lithium acts as a nucleophile to come right in here and pump these electrons up onto the oxygen. Similarly, if I take a Grignard reagent, it more or less reacts as if there were a negative charge on this carbon, the one that's bonded to the magnesium. It then uses those electrons to march as if it were a negatively charged carbon into this carbon bound to the oxygen in our epoxide, pumping these electrons up onto the oxygen and giving me this intermediate. You'll notice that this ethyl group, the CH2CH3 group, has been added on to this CH2 group. The negatively charged oxygen can then be protonated during an acid or water quench to give me this alcohol. This brings me to this set of problems. I want you to predict the products from the following reactions. Now, if you want to, this would be a great place to pause the video and attempt these on your own first, because I'm going to show you the answers momentarily. Let's begin by taking a look at our first example. I have this molecule, which is called vinyl magnesium bromide. It's a Grignard reagent reacting with this molecule, ethyl chloride. Before we begin, I'm going to go ahead and number the carbons in both my starting material and my reactant, just so that we can keep things straight. I've numbered them as shown here. One, two, three, four. You'll see why momentarily. Now, as I've stated before, the carbon that's bonded to the magnesium is much more electronegative than the magnesium. Thus, this carbon, carbon 2, behaves more or less as if there were a negative charge on it. You'll note that over here, this carbon, carbon 3, is bonded to chlorine, which means that this carbon has a partial positive charge. So what in the world happens when you react these two molecules together? The negatively charged carbon, carbon 2, pushes its electrons as if a nucleophile into carbon 3 and kicks off this chloride. There's a bond then formed between carbon 2 and carbon 3, which ultimately forms this product. I'll let you take a moment to look at that to make sure that it makes sense. Here's another example. I've got my Grignard phenyl magnesium bromide reacting with this epoxide. Once again, I'm going to number my carbons, 1, 2, 3, in my epoxide as shown here. As I've stated before, the carbon right here in the ring that's bonded to the magnesium behaves more or less as if there's a negative charge on that carbon. This negatively charged carbon then reacts as a nucleophile and of course is going to attack one of these two carbons in the epoxide. Which one is it going to attack? Carbon 1 or carbon 2? Well, you might remember from our previous chapter that I said that nucleophiles under basic conditions attack the less hindered carbon in epoxides. If this were acidic conditions, then it would attack the more hindered carbon in the epoxide. I should mention, by the way, that Grignard reactions can only proceed under basic conditions. 
Otherwise, you would just attach a proton to this carbon. Thus, this carbon takes its electrons and reacts as a nucleophile, pushing into carbon-1 to form a bond with it, and pumping these electrons up onto the oxygen to give me this intermediate. You can go ahead and pause here and make sure that all the carbons and where they are located in the product make sense to you. Now, of course, this type of reaction, as with all Grignard reactions, is quenched with acid or water. This will protonate this O- and turn it into an OH, which will be my final product. Let's take a look at our organolithium examples. I've got my phenyl lithium here reacting with ethyl chloride. Once again, there's more or less an effective negative charge on this carbon in the ring. There's a partial positive charge on this carbon attached to the chlorine. And for the sake of keeping track of stuff, I'm going to number those carbons 1 and 2. The negatively charged carbon right here bound to the lithium thrusts its electrons down into carbon 1, kicking off the chloride, and gives me this product right here. You could pause it and look at it, and make sure that it makes sense. And here's my last example. This one's kind of interesting. I have once again a Grignard reagent over here. This carbon attached to the magnesium more or less behaves as if there's a negative charge on the carbon. It is an attacking carbon. For the sake of keeping track of stuff, I'm going to number the carbons in my reacting partner over here, 1 and 2. You'll notice that this carbon 1 right here, bonded to an oxygen, has a partial positive charge in it. What is going to occur next? The negatively charged carbon in the Grignard region is going to come in here and form a bond with carbon 1, and as it does so, it's going to push these pi electrons up onto that oxygen, which gives me this intermediate. Once again, I've numbered the carbons 1 and 2 in this intermediate so that you can see where they started at. This negatively charged oxygen will then get protonated when we quench the reaction with acid or water to give me an OH at this position. Now this type of reaction right here might look a little bit scary to you guys at this point. I hope not, but if that's the case, please don't worry too much about it. Try your best to understand it and recognize what's happening here. And keep in mind that we're going to cover this type of reaction in extensive depth for the first three chapters that we cover during our semester two lectures on organic chemistry. All right, that is the end of this lecture, introducing you to organolithiums and Grignard reagents. Please stay tuned to my next lecture in which I continue covering organometallic reagents and reactions. Until then, have an enjoyable rest of your day.